and we open up our slideshow so we can continue. All right, here we are. So hello, everybody. I can see people are joining in. It's very nice to meet you. My name is Sheila Reiner. I'm a nurse by profession, and I mainly work today with stem cell therapy um, and with autistic children, but in the past, I dealt with orthopedic patients and neurological patients. So um, we are today going to talk about different patients and what this kind of treatment can do for them. Um, in a minute, I will let you introduce yourselves so I can be more specific towards what you need. Um, but it's very nice to meet you, and I hope you enjoy our time together today. With no further ado, let's go and start the process. So today we're talking about stem cell therapy and the lecture today has to do with how to uh, actually get to stem cell therapy, what this kind of technology is all about and where are the right clinics for the right patients. Different methods within the stem cell therapy world and it's very interesting to see what the different methods and the different protocols does to each and every individual patient. So just so we can get to know you a little bit, um, sorry, first we're gonna um, talk about the um, uh, different areas that we're gonna speak about today. We're gonna learn about the different options. We're gonna learn about the different patients that, that gets the different kind of protocols. Uh, we're gonna explain the process, how to actually register to each and every clinic. And of course, we're gonna also discuss the post-treatment phase because stem cell therapy will give you advantages, but without the post-treatment phase, it's really very difficult to uh, do the whole process. And of course, we're gonna speak about the different clinics and how you actually get to them, what kind of things you need to have in order to get to the different clinics. So, just so I will know a little bit about you and can help you um, navigate yourselves within the system, please write down in the chat below how old is your patient and what is the diagnosis so I can speak about the relevant clinics. So right now in the chat, it's open. If you can just write down how old is the patient and what is the diagnosis, it will be very helpful. So we can, of course, discuss the right clinics and not waste a lot of time about talking about different random clinics. I'm waiting for your answers right now. Again, how old is the patient and what is the diagnosis that you are looking for treatment? Okay. While you're writing, I'm going to continue. Okay, I can see a 15 year old who has um, infantile autism. So autism at 15, it's no longer infantile. Um, okay, so we're talking about a clinic that offers treatment to teenagers. It's very important to know that there are differences between the different options. Uh, six, year, six and a half year old with autism, okay. Same, so you have more options because there are more protocols for younger children. Who else wants to write down how old is the child? 11 year old, uh, okay, high function ASD. We're gonna talk about a little bit about the differences, of what we expect from high function to what's low function and what are the achievements that we're looking for to get, what kind of Rehabilitation post-treatment period, we are talking about for those children who are higher on the spectrum, lower on the spectrum, it's really important to talk about it. Anybody else wants to write down how old is the patient and what is the diagnosis? Again, we get into our clinics, uh, patients who are very young, very old, we get uh, people that don't have autism, for example, that has other conditions. It's really important to know so we can help you refer yourselves to the right place. Anybody else interested to write down how old is the patient again and what is the diagnosis? All right, so let's continue. Whoever wants to write it down later, it's fine, you can. So 
Of course, each and everybody, each and everyone has a dream that your child will be like any other child, that they will get to all the different, you know, all the different experiences regular children get, that they will manage to get married, to have children, et cetera. And if you are here in this lecture, it means that you are feeling that maybe this is not the case for your child. And that's okay. We understand um, and of course, we try different methods of treatment. I'm sure that all children here were treated with speech therapy, and occupational therapy, et cetera. And I want to tell you that it's really important to continue working with these people because these people are responsible for our rehabilitation process. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. On. Okay. Um, and if you are feeling frustrated right now because your child has reached a point where they stop developing or they're not managing to break this ceiling wall uh, that's, uh, you know, this glass uh, ceiling behind, you know, over their heads and they're not managing to get to the next level of development, I want you to know that I was the same way with my children. With all of my children, and I have four autistic children, I always reach this level that they were not able to pass through and they were not able to acquire more uh, skills. And so when we talk about autistic kids, we know that there is a point in their life where they are struggling to gain more abilities. And if this is the case for you, you are right now in the right place. But let's talk a little bit about what we can do to help these children break these, um, break these barriers and continue developing. Okay, so through the process we're going to discuss today, we're going to see how we can help our children um, and what this treatment can do for you. Uh, and of course, what is necessary for you to have. So a little bit about how we got to this treatment. I'm a mother of four children. Uh, my eldest child, his name is Dolev. He is now nearly 11 years old sitting downstairs because he managed to somehow escape from school today pretending he is sick, which is really hilarious. Um, Dolev was two and a half years old when he was diagnosed with autism. And a month later, he was also diagnosed with very, very difficult to manage epilepsy. He was drug resistant. Um, and six months down the line, he was three years old. His brother was born. When his brother was born, I remembered that Back in my early days as a nursing student, one of my professors had said that cord blood can in the future help neurological conditions. And with this sliver of hope, we have collected my middle child, his name is Devo, you can see the child with the very round hair. <laughs> Um, I collected Nevo's cord blood in order to help his older brother. Little did we know that Nevo is also uh, autistic, and he eventually received his own cord blood here in Israel uh, within a research program. So we have waited. Back at the time, there was no research program here in Israel. But in January 17, Professor Kurtzberg came to Israel to give a lecture to medical uh, facilities and parents of children with autism and CP. And she had declared that she's opening her extended protocol access to people not from the US. And of course, being in the audience, I ran down the, the platform and I asked her, I begged her to take my son into uh, consideration. She said, fine, no problem. Here's the form, fill it up, which I of course immediately did. We have waited in the list for Duke University for over two years. Within this time, my eldest child had started deteriorating. His epilepsy became a huge issue. We could not manage it. He was not developing at all. He was not potty trained, et cetera, et cetera. At a certain point, we realized that we have no more time to wait. Mm -hmm. And we had started to send different um, different doctors all around the world, his medical file, we got lots of help doing it and we re got rejected again and again and again and again. At some point, we've managed to find a place that would take us. It was Swiss Medical Company. We will talk about it a little bit down the line. Back at the time, it was in Moscow. Today, it's in Belgrade, Serbia. 
flying over there must have been the most incredibly scary experience I've ever had. The only thing that we knew about this clinic was that they treat with stem cell therapy. We did not know anything about it. And that my colleague, I was working in orthopedics back then, and one of my colleagues had a sister who lived in Moscow. Her sister went into the clinic just to say, you know, to check that it's really a clinic, that they have permits and stuff like that. And she came back telling us that it's supposedly the best clinic in the world. You should definitely go. It's amazing. You know, rich people go there, et cetera, et cetera. That's all the information we had. And with this little bit of information and lots of doctors behind us here from Israel that were completely against it, we left because we had nothing to lose. So we went to Moscow, he was treated there, and we came back home here to Israel. And the month following was a very strange month. He started very rapidly developing. And after 30 days, we realized that something very strange had happened. We've not seen an ER doctor in 30 days. This was very uncommon for us. <laughs> it was so uncommon that I knew every single ER doctor from the top to the bottom of the country by name. And if he had kids, how old are his kids? And if they had birth dates, this is how long we spend in ERs in Israel for the five and a half, nearly six years of my son's life. Very concerned, we went to get his EG done and realized that he has no more epileptic signs. Amazing. We kept going for more treatments over the last five years for him, and he is today nearly 11. Five years, no epilepsy. He is verbal. He will forever be autistic, but he is a functioning autistic child. Following his experience, we treated our younger children as well. They had cord blood because we managed to collect their cord blood, and they also received more treatments in Swiss Medica. Um, but this was my experience. Very soon after he was treated, I realized that this information needs to come out. And slowly we started speaking about it until at a certain point we decided to open a company that assists people from all over the world, get information and get to the right facilities for them. Today, we're gonna speak a little bit about it. So what are stem cell therapy? What are stem cells? You and I and every living creature, including trees, plants, animals, um, we all live by the functioning of stem cells. This is the basic unit that allows our body to regenerate. If we're talking about plants, is to grow the plant. If we're talking about babies, humans, animals, it's to manage to regenerate our cells. And of course, it's also the basic cell that creates life. So what we called as egg or sperm, this is a form of stem cell. This cell will join and start developing really, really, really fast. At a certain point within the embryo development, you will see two circles. It will be the outer circle and the inner circle. The outer circle will become the placenta and will implant itself within the uterine wall. And the inside circle will become eventually the baby or whatever animal it is, okay? It's very important to talk about it because the next page will explain to you what is the difference between the different items that we know now as stem cell therapy. Stem cell will reach a location in your body that needs regenerating. Usually it's because of a process called apoptosis. This is the process where a cell dies and the body needs to regenerate itself and grow the same kind of cell all over again. This process happens in your and my body millions of times each and every day. So our bone marrow, which makes stem cells, is very busy creating these cells in order to help its body regenerate itself. In fact, natural death is when your body stops making stem cells. And that means that your body cannot regenerate itself fast enough. And this is what we know as death from old age. Now, when your body gets hurt, so maybe you have a bit of a cough, or maybe you got, you know, a bruise, or you got cut in your hand, 
or your bone broke, your body knows to send more stem cells into this location to help your body regenerate faster. At a certain amount of injury, your body does not have enough stem cells to send. And that means the recovery process becomes longer and longer. What we know about autism is that some of the problem has to do with our immune system, where there's an, a low key inflammation in the brain, but not only in the brain, we can see it in joints, the gut, we can see it sometimes on skin rashes, etc. We know our immune system is sometimes a little weak and our body sometimes creates these inflammations. Stem cells attracts itself to inflammation Therefore, this is the connection. This is how these two parts connect. Let's discuss the different kinds of stem cells. The most famous kind of stem cell is cord blood stem cell, which is one out of many different options to receive stem cells from our body. In fact, there are five options to draw stem cells from the human body. One, cord blood. This is the blood that's inside the cord while the baby is born. Our babies create 150% of their blood need. So if this is a three kilo baby, he will create 300 milliliters of blood to use for its own body. And then 150 milliliters extra to make the connection within the placenta and the cord to change nutrients between the baby and mother. And this is the blood we collect during childbirth. We will cut the cord once the baby finishes the birthing process. Placenta is still in mother's body. We cut the cord, mother gets baby, and now we are waiting for the placenta to be delivered. On that part, we do take a needle and a special kit. We insert the needle within the veins of the cord and collect the cord, the cord blood. The cord blood is a blood unit, which means I can give it from day zero. So a baby that had a severe heart surgery will be able to receive this kind of unit of blood post-treatment. What we know with this kind of unit is that the uh, stem cells within the unit are the same origin, like these very old stem cells from the first stage of conception. So we know these stem cells are able to do more for the body. They're very, very ancient stem cells, and they are more powerful in order to get into our body systems and rebuild the whole baby. And that's why this kind of stem cells is considered very, very, very good quality. Another advantage of cord blood, which is very important that if one of you has a unit of your child, as that other than bone marrow, this is the only kind of cell that can become bone marrow. It's really important, especially in populations where the genetic differences between the different individuals is very large, it's very big, like here in Israel. Here in Israel, we have people who are, um, whose, whose genetics is influenced from Yemen, from Syria, from um, Morocco, but also from Poland and Iceland and England and, you know, and, uh, and the Orients and all these people that live here in Israel. And so if I need a unit that will allow a cancer patient, for example, to receive new bone marrow, this is a really good unit for them. But to get bone marrow, I need matching that is very, very high which I do not need for autism or for CP, for example. For autism and CP, I only need blood type that is matching, that is all. So I can take a unit that's donated and give a child or an adult based only on their blood type, which is very important because a lot of children are not getting cord blood collected for them. If you're planning to have another baby, yes, it's definitely recommended to collect cord blood. This is a medical unit that can allow us to treat a child or an adult. Another thing to remember about cord blood is that it has two phenomenons that you will see directly after getting treated. 
One is the smell. To preserve cord blood, you use different preservatives. DSMO is the most popular one. And you also use albumin agents after in order to preserve the integrity of the cells. These two has a very special phenomenon, a scent. The scent comes out of our sweat, it comes out of our breathing, our urine, and you will definitely smell it. It will smell somewhere like uh, corn, uh, you know, corn preservative or something like that. Um, and it's very, very strong. There is no mistaking with it. Another phenomenon that happens right after is change of urine color. It will disappear within the first times that your child or your patient will pee. Um, so these are two things that you must know about cord blood. Um, we will talk about the rest of the side effects in the end. A second source that we are going to meet now is the umbilical cord and placenta derived cells or what we'd like to call MSCs, mesenchymal stromal cells. Mesenchymal cells coming from fat tissue, uh, stroma. Stroma is fat tissue. And you can see in the picture, this white sheen around the umbilical cord and around the placenta. This is called Wharton jelly. And Wharton jelly is very rich with stem cells. There is something very specific that um, is special about these cells is that they don't have HLA mechanism. HLA is this protein that we have in all of our body cells that identifies ourselves as ourselves and somebody else as somebody else. And because the placenta is a neutral organ, the body of the mother does not recognize the embryo as an alien person. So somebody who's not the mother, a different organ. And this is what keeps this baby from the body of the mother attacking the baby. Because it doesn't have HLA, it means that I can take these cells from any healthy delivery and give it to any healthy human, any, sorry, any ill human. So this is a really good source. And there's another something that you have to know because it doesn't have HLA, it doesn't influence uh, women's fertility. So if you have a little girl, when you give blood, we know that later on, it can affect her fertility. She will have to get anti-D injection before pregnancy. With this kind of treatment, you don't have any different HLA. That means that your daughter, if you have a girl, because this is only relevant for girls, um, is not being subjected to this particular material. Her body doesn't identify these cells as um, an object that doesn't belong to her body. We know that these kind of cells are very, very safe to use. Um, same safety as cord blood, and there's no problem giving them. Different than cord blood, they cannot become stem cells. Uh, sorry, of our body stem cells. They cannot become bone marrow. And that is one big difference that we have to remember. When we're talking about cerebral palsy, for example, we know that cerebral palsy needs more uh, materials that are in the cord blood than they need MSC. So when I, if you, there is somebody here with uh, cerebral palsy, you should know that this treatment is not for you. You need cord blood. Let's review the last main option. And then if there are adults here, I'll talk about adult options. We're talking about bone marrow, different than cord blood and um, MSC that do not need any, um, any invasive procedure, just an IV or an IM injection. So giving it through the vein or giving it through an injection to your butt or thigh. On this method, we use child's own stem cells. So we need to get them from this child's bone marrow. I don't usually like sending children to this kind of treatment. And the reason I don't is because it involves an invasive procedure done under anesthesia for a child. Any procedure that has to do with taking out bone marrow from child's bone subjects this child to one major um, issue, which is infection. 
An infection in a bone is a very big deal. Yes, we treat it with antibiotics, but sometimes this is an infection for life. It's a good method of work, but I don't recommend it usually for small children. The giving of bone marrow is being given through intratacal approach. That means injection through the spine. Again, I don't recommend these kind of injections. Yes, we do them. We do them every single day. Of course, they are fairly safe to use, but they also have side effects. Side effects that are not in the other two methods. Who I do send to these uh, kind of treatments are children that parents are not interested in donated material. Um, this child is not able to receive foreign donation for other reasons, usually autoimmune, autoimmunological reasons. And those children do get bone marrow. It's slightly less effective than the other two methods, but it is a good method. Two things I haven't mentioned in this slideshow because it's not as popular for children and children under teenagerhood are not included in is when uh, stem cells from fat tissue. So women like me who may have had a few children and have some fat in their tummies um, or people who are older um, and have some fat in their tummies, we can liposuction the stomach, take out the stem cells as you remember in this treatment, in umbilical cord treatment, we take it from Wharton jelly. This is a fat tissue. So we can also do treatments from fat, again, just for adults or older teenagers. And we can injection in, inject them into your hip, into your knees, uh, sometimes into your vein in order to help uh, with restoring body, okay? And the last one is screen grafts. We can make from stem cells that are in our skin, we can make skin grafts. Again, this is a very important bit of information, but it's not for children. Okay, so I'm going to stop at this point. We're going to continue in a minute. I just want to see if there are any questions about what we have discussed until now. So we're not going to end up with tons and tons of questions in the end. You're more than welcome to um, to push on your speakers and just speak or write it in the chat. Any questions about cord blood, MSC, and um, bone marrow? Yes, I have a question. Go for it. Okay, thank you so much for presenting this. I think it's really nice to know the different ways. Actually, I'm getting through this process for my daughter. Uh, and uh, What's her I diagnosis? Uh, I put in the chat box, you know, it's 11 years old. Okay, so autism. Yes, and also learning difficulties and cognitive difficulties yeah. as well. So actually, um, I was going through different clinics, you know, to be honest, uh, I'm here just want because I have watched some of the videos from you, you know, actually with uh, different specialists, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just thinking about uh, if you are going to compare these different three uh, methods at the end or in the um, in the rest of the presentation. If yes, I'm going to stop and waiting for your- No, why don't you ask and then I can give you a specific answer. Yeah, actually it's very important for me to, to be honest, we are not going to go to bone marrow, but actually for the number one and number two, okay. there are diff uh, different clinics. And I want, I'm not sure about which one is better. I know that for the first one, I think uh, uh, Cold blood. I think there is only one clinic. Am, am I right? It's CBC. So okay. So CBC Health. It's a very good clinic. It's not the only one, but it's very very good. We worked in the past with a few different ones. Um, they have a few advantages. First of all, cord blood. You should know is the quickest procedure. It takes five minutes. Seriously, <laughs> very very quick. You come in the morning of treatment. Um, you sign some papers what we call informed consent, we'll talk about it in a little bit. And then they um, allow you to choose sedation if you like. Um, some kids do it with sedation, some kids do it without sedation. And CBC, the sedation is done through a gas mask, like nitrose, what we call laughing gas. Um, they take blood tests because they have to make sure that the blood test that you have reported is really the blood test that you have, the unit that you have and also the real blood test of the child. 
Um, and they also test, take some general tests that you'll get the results later on. It's mainly to uh, make sure that she's not sick with anything that needs reporting to the health system, um, like HIV, uh, syphilis, stuff like that, because this is an mandatory test by World uh, Health Organization. Um, and they also take some nutrient tests to give you recommendation after. Afterwards, they'll give you a drug. Uh, it's called um, antihistamine is because we know that cord blood can cause some um, allergic reactions. I personally have never seen it. And if you will speak to Dr. <laughs> Niels, if you've seen our videos, you have met him already. Um, he will say that he only saw it three times in his career. He is a doctor that deals with cord blood for nearly 17 years now. A very long time just to see it three times, which yeah. is also why we do it in a clinic. So we have means to care for it. Yeah. Um, and then they will inject the cord blood. It takes a couple of minutes to receive the cord blood. You can do it by IV or just push injection. Um, in CBC, they do it IV. Here in Israel, we take a big syringe, stick the cord blood inside and just slowly push it in. Um, mm. To be very honest, there's no difference between the two uh, different methods. They, they flush it and within an hour, you're finished through and through. Then they mm -hmm. will ask you to wait in the waiting room for a couple hours and that's it. So this is cord blood. Mm -hmm. Very, very fast. Uh, CBC are uh, saying that they give 50 million cells per kilo. Mm -hmm. We know that this is what they are obligated to do. Um, with uh, MSC, it's a longer procedure. And then it has something I ask the patient, uh, well, did your child get her period? Or if it's a boy, does it have hair on their face, you know, because mm. there's a different protocol for teenagers than there is for children or babies. So babies mm -hmm. get the very easiest protocol. It's two hours long. Uh, children get more. They get two days of treatment. And then teenagers have three days of treatment. So on each day, they get stem cells. Um, and it's just a different protocol. And they saw over time when we started going there, five or six years ago, the protocol was completely different. And with time, the stuff that we know about stem cells changed and we know how to adjust the different protocols better. Um, so mm. you should know that there's a difference between where we are going. Yeah. Now in terms of results, because I yeah. know this is something that people mainly ask. Want to compare. Yeah. With autism, I haven't seen a difference. Here's what mm -hmm. I can see. And we'll talk about rehabilitation in a little bit. I saw a difference between patients regarding what happened after treatment. So what was your post-treatment like? So if you saw a speech therapist, if you did some hydrotherapy, uh, the way you speak to the child, the demands you have from the child, all these things, they influence the child's ability to learn. And I saw a difference between parents who had combined different protocols. So a lot of the times we went for one treatment, the result was so-so, and then we changed protocol and the result got better. And it made no difference what kind of protocol we've done first. So what do you mean of the protocol? Sorry. So, I mean, people who's done MSC and then did cord blood and vice versa. Oh, yeah. So, the different approaches. Yeah, the different approaches. So I did see a difference between these two. And personally, I believe that both options are great. With my eldest child, I had no cord blood. And so I've mainly done MSC. I didn't have any cord blood for him. And also, I didn't have a lot of money then. <laughs> and... MSC was cheaper than what was cord blood back in the time. Um, he's now not doing any more treatments. He stopped having treatments this summer. It was his last, and maybe it really will be his last, uh, I hope. With my youngest two, I had cord blood for them. They received cord blood first, and then um, they received MSC. With MSC, it's important to say babies under the age of three and under 14 kilo. We usually recommend to start with cord blood and then you can move on to MSC. Um, however, I did have children who received MSC even before the age of three. Then they get a baby protocol. There is a protocol adjusted to small 
body weights. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I see Martinez that you have not managed to get the first half of the lecture. I'm inviting you to stay in the end and I'll go back and explain it for you. Okay. So if somebody had missed the beginning, I know there's quite a few. Um, <coughs> please stay online. In the end, after everything is done, I will go back for you and explain it to you. Okay. Any more questions? It's um, a great time to yeah. ask. Yeah, it's still, it's, sorry, it's, it's still I have, uh, I, I Go didn't. Go for it, this is your time. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, uh, so you said uh, in, for autism, for ASD, you didn't see any any difference between no. these two approach. It's very important how the post-treatment will be, okay? okay? So, yeah, actually, how about the side effects, you know, because this is something that we usually, okay, so I, know, I, I know there are some short-term side okay, effects, so but side to be honest, I'm thinking term. about the long-term, exactly. Okay, so this is what short term and long-term are similar, okay? Both, both two approaches. So cord blood and stem cells, they have joint uh, side effects. Other than the two I mentioned about cord blood, they are unique for cord blood. That is the smell and the urine change of color, which happens in the first hours. Other than that, they have similar side effects on treatment. So that will be fever and shivering and allergy, which is very rare in MSC. I haven't had any reports for allergy. I did have reports of allergy, and this is something that you all need to know with any kind of stem cells. Do not feed your children new foods in the first week or two. It has nothing to do with allergic response. It has something to do with the fact that your immune system is very, very alert. Okay. And when your mm. immune system is very, very alert, even things that you are not truly allergic to can respond with your body. So new foods in the first two weeks after treatment are big no-nos. Okay. Um, something else that I forgot to mention, please come to this treatment healthy. No sniffles, no ear infection, no, no uh, eye infection, no strange rashes you haven't attended to. Be healthy, okay? Because your body is getting now stem cells who are attracting themselves to inflammation. And if you mm -hmm. come with an ear infection, you'll get a very expensive medicine for your ear infection. That's just ridiculous. You don't want to do that. Um, yeah. Other than that, long-term side effects. So the main one that all parents complain about is hyperactivity. That means that your brain is working over time, which is what we want. However, it's not very comfortable when your child also works over time and runs around your house crazy. Normal response. This response can also manifest itself in aggressiveness same same thing your brain works over time and anxiety same issue brain works over time etc specifically to anxiety you should know that sometimes especially with autistic kids their conscious level gets up and when they understand that the world is different with what they have perceived it to be, that can cause anxiety. And this is not a side effect of the treatment. It's a side effect of your child understanding, which is very miserable for us parents, but is normal for a child that now understands new information about a world that he lived in or she lived in for a while. But actually, this ADHD that you're talking about is a long term, you're like, it can take effect, a right? few weeks, and some parents even respond. Uh, okay, it's a few weeks. Respond for a few months. Yeah, a few months. I can because tell actually you actually the difference from one child to another. For example, okay, because my child has already ADHD, and she's taking medication. When she swings around from happens. the chandelier, we'll have this conversation again. So it's again. Sorry. When your daughter swings around from the chandelier, we'll talk about it again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So. And I can tell you that there are differences between the children. So, for example, my oldest, he's a fast responder. So he mm -hmm. gets himself next day, he's in, he's all in. My middle child, he's a slow responder. He got treated last August. He's just now responding. So now he's also hyperactive. Now he's also, you know, very emotional. He's very mm -hmm. aggressive. We had very nice four months with no response. And all of a sudden, he responds now. So it's also an issue because sometimes there's a very big time gap between when your child has actually been treated to when they actually respond. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, when I talk about long-term side effects, so I these are the long-term long -term side effects. It's, it's even longer because I read some article about uh, some kind of irregular group of cells, you know, probably which can make like something yeah. like two more these kind of things. In no, very long what you're term. talking about is a little different. We are talking about now about something that has to do with the lab work. So mm -hmm. when we get stem cells from um from cord blood, we just use whatever we get. You know, we don't do anything to them. But when we get uh, stem cells from MSC, so from placenta and umbilical cord, obviously we cannot implant placenta as it is. We have to throw out the cells and then we grow them in the lab. After mm -hmm. five phases, you're not supposed to administer these cells. And what we saw, especially when we worked with clinics in Mexico, is that they do not freeze their cells. When that happens, that means your cell can regenerate, so have another generation passed, and there's mm -hmm. no supervision that will happen. And we know that when we stop making the cells past five generations, then there's no, no risk of cancer. However, mm -hmm. there is an issue. It mainly has to do with adults, not young children, because with young children, the most common cancer is uh, bone marrow cancer, so what we call blood cancer. We can see the signs on the child before we see uh, I'm signs. sorry. I'm sorry. Someone, yes, has, sorry? Uh, their, someone has not muted their microphone. And it sounded I can't hear you again. Someone is uh, having their microphone activated, and the sound is coming in from them. I, I don't understand, Matthias. Can you say it again? I can hear someone else on the channel speaking while you are speaking. You're getting in someone that is not muted. I really don't understand what you're saying. I'm really sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay. We're talking about um, articles that connected between stem cells, use of stem cells, and cancer just to make, mm -hmm. to make sure that everybody understands. So we know that if a person has cancer already, okay, mm -hmm. I will give this person stem cells with no chemotherapy, mm -hmm. okay? Then stem cells will activate like growth hormones, mm -hmm. okay? And that means that they will help this cancer that exists already, to become mm -hmm. larger and more meaningful, but mm -hmm. they don't create some. They don't create cancer cells on their own. So if your okay. child is healthy and your child gets stem cells, they will not get cancer. But if your child has cancer, or an adult, mm -hmm. let's take an adult, okay, that has cancer and they will get stem cells, then they will have a bigger problem with their cancer if they don't get chemotherapy. Because we mm -hmm. do use cord blood to treat blood cancer. We give chemotherapy and then we give the new immune system, the new bone marrow in the form of cord blood. How we can find it out? We can do, we have to do chemotherapy, you said? Because I'm no. not very familiar with medical no, no. before doing the stem cell. Okay, so with children, Usually, if a child has cancer, we will see the child sick. Yes, of course. Okay. We will see the child that he is sick a lot before we will check. Yeah, blood. definitely. Yeah. With an adult, okay, if yeah. patients here who are adults, there are blood yes. tests that you have to do first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So with so children, that's... cancer behaves differently than where it is with adults. And part of the reason why I say do not come sick to the clinic is yeah. because it's an important issue. Yeah. Okay. We it's had yeah, we had a video called What You Dr. Niels, and he believes the first uh, method, which is the cord blood, is safer than the MSC because they are not manipulating the, the blood, you know, the cord okay. blood. Well, there are different what do you opinions. Think? There are different opinions, and with this, this is Look, all the clinics I work with on a daily basis are good, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think that every doctor wants to believe that what they do is the best. Yeah, of course. The truth is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay? yeah. 
Uh, well, let's say I don't like bone marrow method because I know that there are side effects that don't exist in the other two. Mm -hmm. I, I will send a patient there because I know it's fairly safe and we know to monitor these side effects. Okay. Do I, will I go there with my child? No, I would prefer something that doesn't have an invasive process. Yeah. But for some people, this is their preferred method and that is Perfectly fine. It's I a see. safe protocol. Yeah. Has side effects? Yes, it does. But it's a safe protocol, which is why I present it here. If I would believe that these protocols were not safe, I would not present them. I mm. did get treated with my kids with MSC, and I also had them given cord blood. Both ways are safe. Mm. Some doctors will say, well, my method is the best. I do agree with Dr. Neal that for CP patients, for example, they are not eligible for MSC. It's not good enough for them because mm -hmm. cord blood has ingredients that do not exist in MSC. MSC is one kind of cell, not many kinds of cells. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. And with older autistic children, I'm not talking about the little babies or children under the age of eight. I'm talking about those children who are already in teenagerhood. I believe that it's probably going to be wise to combine protocols because each one has its unique extras. Well, mm -hmm. cord blood doesn't have just MSC. It has significantly small amounts of MSC. It has other kinds of stem cells which are important. But I know that some children react better to MSC. Do I know in advance? The answer is no. I don't know in advance. Today, there is no test that shows me what patient should go to what treatment. Um, at least not with those patients who can get different kinds. Like for CP, I know they just need cord blood. But with autism, no, we don't know in advance. Okay. How about learning difficulties? Learning difficulties, because this is the main focus. Okay, so... My kids are also uh, dyslexic. I can tell you that they are reading now. Mm -hmm. um, do I know to tell you um, if it's specific for reading difficulties? No. No, it's um, she has dyslexia, but uh, totally she has developmental delays. She has learning difficulties in any okay. area. She's like, when in, like you're talking math, about English, math, she's math. It's math by her autism. All of these learning difficulties that we see with autistic kids, they're masked by the autism. So we don't know if they are the original problem. If my kid has ADHD because he has bad sensory issues, because he has a lot of stimulants in his brain, because of his sleeping issues, and that's why he has ADHD, or does he originally have ADHD? We don't know. So until we improve the autism, issue we cannot give an answer to any of the other things i can tell you that usually they walk hand in hand so mm -hmm. when their adhd gets improved their learning difficulties gets improved their sleeping gets improved usually it works together um yeah so yeah you're right and tell you yeah and uh, a part of cbc clinics what are because i thought this is only cbc clinic doing the oh, cold that. blood but you said there are other clinics as yes, well yes there are um we have cb center in slovakia i have a few issues with this clinic number one is that i sent an autistic child there in the past and instead of giving them cord blood they gave msc and so that's sort of not the point by going there mm. um they do manipulate their cord blood which i don't like mm -hmm. um there is bakey clinic in thailand the issue with them is that they're extremely expensive so um they're twice more than cbc by price mm. we are now working with a new clinic called samara but the issue with them is that when I inspected the protocol, they did not use um, albumin um, protein in the end of the freezing. Mm. And when I spoke to other labs, I heard from them, from the other labs that I spoke to, including the lab here in Israel, is that when you don't use albumin, when you defrost the unit, it doesn't, there's a problem with the integrity of the cells. So some of the cells will burst. 
um, a higher percentage, sorry, of the sales force. And mm -hmm. I'm now starting to, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to work with them. We have interviewed them. We haven't brought them in for a lecture yet. I want to speak to the head of their lab to hear why they don't use it. Mm. And the way I realized that they don't was when I asked about smell and urine color. Mm. When I asked, I always, always ask because I know these are telltale signs for cord blood. However, they do give cord blood and have a very interesting protocol. Maybe when I speak to the head of their lab, I'll think, you know, I'll think huh? something else. How about CBC Clinic? Do you think they just they are I think, following? Their... I think they're good. I really good. do. They do exactly the same that what we do here in Israel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, the manager of their labs know the manager of our labs here in Israel, mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. are both members of the um, United uh, European Cord Blood Bank Association, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that the one in Samara, Russia, is not. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm. They didn't even have an inspection yet. So again, this is another issue, whether your clinic is supervised, not supervised, super, who supervises you? For example, the clinic um, that does MSC in Serbia, Swiss Medica, they are supervised by their local uh, administration of health, their Ministry of Health. Um, and Russia is a bit problematic with it. Um, we were treated in the past in Russia, but through Swiss medical company. So it's a little different. There are different mm. issues with the different clinics. When you come to my lecture, I usually speak about the medical side, mm. not so much the bureaucratic side. Um, <laughs> but when you yeah, dive into it, it's a huge issue. Um, and you really need to navigate the situation. Yeah, um, thank you so much. That yeah, I think CBC clinic is very good for us because I'm I'm living in the UK, you know, and of course it's yeah. easy for us to to have a they, clinic. They in have Europe. lots of patients from the UK. They really yeah, do. and also I prefer to have something some some I prefer some clinic in the in the Europe because it's easier for I me to, to do. There know. was a question in the chat about Angel's help. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And I do want to answer about Angel's hope before we move on to the next part of the lecture. Um. Angel Hope is a very interesting story. So when Angel Hope was founded, it was considered very promising. We interviewed them. You can find the interview online in our um, in our platforms. And then very soon after we interviewed them, we started hearing back from patients. And we had quite a few patients that complained or rather had explained but they let them see the cells in through a microscope. Now, when somebody lets you see a cell, a living cell under a microscope, I'm not necessarily happy with the infectious control environment. And we did have some reports that they use live cells. When you use live cells, so I have grown these cells in a laboratory, and usually, by fifth generation, I freeze them. The reason I freeze them, or the labs do, because I don't freeze any cells. I don't have any in my house. But the reason they do freeze them is to preserve the level of development. Then they take a sample and they run it through tests to make sure that it's clean, it's safe, it doesn't have cancer cells, it hadn't developed any diseases. Usually we talk about infectious control, Uh So I would say um, any uh, hepatitis, any of that stuff. But when I freeze the unit, I've stopped the unit's living. So it doesn't continue on developing. When I use fresh cells, so cells who had never been frozen, I don't have this control. So if between when I made the sample to when the sample had met the hostess, so the child or adult who gets this unit, some time had passed, even a few hours, on the way the sample can get infected. So when you see, especially in places like CBC or Swiss Medica, you can see the frozen vials. You see the frozen bag or the frozen vial, you will see that they arrive frozen. They're not made on location. They're made in a sterile lab 
under very sterile conditions and they are kept frozen. So suspended life freezing. And then when it's time to give it, you freeze it and you can see the bags are very cold. So are the vials because MSC are kept in vials. You can see the vials are frozen when they arrive, they're being defrosted and then given. There's some safety measures done with it, which for a very long time, we were not sure if they were done in Angel's Hope or not. We are considering, we've issued a warning on them because of that reason. Obviously, it's very difficult for us to go into their labs and inspect them. And that's part of the reason why we don't work with them. So it may be different now, but it wasn't in the past. And we first got an indication when the when parents came back and said, oh my God, it was so cool. They let us see the cell under a microscope. So we don't like it. We don't like it when people manipulate the cells or take the cells out of the the their canister or whatever and, and show parents. We, I don't think it's safe. And that's my main objection with Angel's Hope. Their protocol is quite typical. There's nothing very complicated with it. Um, but that's something that's, for me, it's an alarm bell. I, I would personally not go there. If somebody else goes there, they just need to be aware that this is an issue. Don't know what their protocol is like right now. Uh, don't know what their behavior is like right now with their lab. But that is an issue. You should know that this is something that you need to be aware of. Any other questions before we continue on to the next stage? I got a question. What labs do you recommend? What uh, clinic do you recommend in the U.S.? I'm, I'm in the U.S. Okay. So. Sorry, you... I was not there earlier. So I <laughs> might miss it. That's okay. <laughs> U.S. is an issue. Um, technically in the U.S. for autism, you cannot get treatment in Duke University. You can for CP, uh, because they have finished their autism study already. They haven't finished the CP study. Um, we have gone through quite a few clinics in the U.S., but we have interviewed publicly a clinic in, um, I think it was, Arizona, Dr. Travis's. And with him, what we heard was causing us to uh, what we call raise a brow. Uh, he said, and I'm just quoting him, that under U.S. law, if you make your cells on your own and you give it just to your patients in your facility, the Administry of Health uh, Regulation, so FDA, does not need to supervise you. Now, um, it may be true. So this may be the case. And in that case, I can just say that there's no supervision on their lab. So they may be working perfectly fine. And they may be, because what, from what he said, they do. Okay, and we have a tape. You can watch his taping. Um, but it also may not be fine. And I don't have any way to know. So different to CBC Health and different to Swiss Medica, where the Ministry of Health supervises them. So they come visit the lab, they come interview the staff, they take samples and check them in the lab. Here, this might not be the case. The law may have changed. Um, I can tell you that the protocols in the U.S. are fine. So when I look on paper and I see the protocols, they look okay to me as a clinician, but the lab is an issue, which is a part that you and I don't have any way to control. The only people that has a way to control is the clinic and the administration. So when you choose a clinic, you have to ask who supervises you? Can you show me a document saying that somebody had visited you? Are you a member? For example, in Europe, this is something very common to ask. Are you a member of the European Union for Cord Blood Administration Association, for example? Or are you being um, followed by Cord Blood Bank Association of any kind, for example? So this is quite an issue. Same goes for stem cells, okay? 
Now I can tell you here in Israel, you can extract stem cells from fat and inject it back to yourself in your joints. Okay, uh, we have a clinic here called Provo. It's very common procedure. I have to say it personally, I'm definitely considering it. I have very bad knees. I have very bad wrists. I worked in as a nurse for a very long time, hurt my back, uh, lifted plenty of heavy patients. I have some body damages in my joints. I'm definitely, definitely considering it. Um, and again, I have plenty of stomach fat that I can use. If you have the same, I strongly recommend you do. It's a wonderful way to use my stomach fat. Okay, so regarding to U.S. clinics, that's the main issue. As far as I know, their protocols are fine. All the ones that we've looked at, the actual medical protocol is fine. The problem is with regulating the, the clinic. That's the main issue. <clears throat> Nasal spray. I want to talk about this. Okay, so let me see. Here we go. I'm going to stop the, record, the share for a sec for a minute. If you can put yourself on mute, please. Can you put yourselves on mute? Okay, so nasal spray. It looks like this. These are vials. This one is empty, obviously. Um, but there are vials of nasal spray that you can have exosomes. Exosomes are the inside of stem cell. Okay, basically the active part. In your brain, if you'll each take your tongue and go all the way back on the roof of your mouth, you'll feel a soft area. That soft area also applies to your nasal cavities, so the one coming out from your nose. If you will use stem cells or exosomes of stem cells in a vial, these will come frozen, by the way. They will come frozen. You'll have to put them in your freezer and take one at the time out, and you will spray them into your nose. You can get some stem cell benefit using just nasal spray. I have to say, I've used it myself. I use it on my children. Um, of course, under the guidance of a doctor. Yeah, don't buy them on your own uh, decision. Use a doctor. Um, and yes, it's definitely a beneficial way to receive stem cells. And most clinics today also offer exosomes, especially ones that deals with MSC. Any other questions? I can see, uh, Laura, you've raised your hand. Do you want to ask something before we continue? Oh, oh yes, you can uh, apply it in bone marrow. It's like, um, like a good alternative instead of the uh, core blood. Okay, uh, so we, I don't know if you're here when we discussed it, so I'm going to say it now, because if you didn't, were you here when I introduced the different methods? Um, no, I, I, I okay. So I stay in the end, and I will, uh, I will introduce them again in the end of the lecture because there's quite a few people. I just want to move on to the next part because I want us to be able to continue. Okay, okay, thank okay. You. Okay, so what do you need to get to the different clinics? It's very important. This is where you write. First thing you need is full medical file. In this medical file, any bit of medical history of your child or the patient, whoever the patient is needs to be inside. So whether this child was vaccinated, what kind of vaccines did he get? Um, what does each child eat? Does he have any food allergies? Does he have any medicational allergies? What his development was like? What was your pregnancy like? Um, what his abilities? Does this child walk? Does this child talk? Does this child sleep? Um, diagnosis, so if your child is autistic, where's his diagnostic papers? If this child was diagnosed as a one-year-old and he is 15-year-old, a follow-up. A follow-up that says he's autistic, this is his abilities, he was diagnosed at this age, where does he go to school, stuff like that. If your child has epilepsy or any other medical condition, we need to know, okay? If this child has any medical needs, we need to know. When your child gets to treatment center, there should be zero surprises for the staff, okay? If your child needs to be sedated, we need to know. Anything like that has to be included in written form in your medical file, of course, in English. So if you have your medical file in any other language that's not English, please translate it. The other thing that clinics love having are videos of the child that shows typical behavior. 
sleeping, eating, walking, interacting with other people, short videos, 30 seconds, not more. So that is your medical file. You've got to give it to every clinic, whether your clinic asks for it or whether they don't. And if they don't, ask yourself, why don't you? The very bare minimum should be a questionnaire about your child. And when I divide the clinics into different categories regarding how good is your clinic, when you ask me, how good is this clinic? I usually ask, well, did they ask you anything about your child? Or did they just said, oh, he has autism? Sure, send him in. No, if a clinic asks zero questions about your child, other than the title, I am suspecting this clinic now. The bare minimum is for this clinic to have some paperwork or a questionnaire about your child. That's the bare minimum. Um, but you should be aware that all of this information is on you, the parent, to supply. And if you didn't, you should be very concerned. Um, is there a clinic in India? Um, okay, so India. We read quite a few articles from India. We did not reach out to any of the clinics in India because it's really far from Israel. And usually we don't have a lot of people wanting to go there. From the research I've read, there are some very good clinics there, um, but I'm not familiar with any specifics. So again, the same guidelines. Who supervises you? What's your protocol like? What is the clinic's behavior like? Are they asking information about my child? Do they want to see videos? Do they have online consultation? These are telltale signs whether a clinic is good or not good. Second stage is, um, and I can't see the sighting. Um, when we are asking for a clinic to give us consultations, okay? So if your clinic gives a consultation, we know it's good. Okay, so consultation from clinic, very important. Okay, and um, again, we're all here for the same reason. And the reason is that we want to help children, help them develop, help them do well. And for each one of us, this should be the goal. So hang on. Back, back down. Okay, so what we're talking now is about post-treatment. I want to put a few words on it. So for post-treatment, you should know that that means all the stuff you do after treatment of, and for the next six months. While stem cell therapy can help with brain function, it will not teach your child for you. So if your child's tissue is doing better, so their brain tissue or their lung tissue or their muscle tissue does better. That's great. But with no physiotherapy, with no speech therapy, with no social therapy, this treatment is only half the job. So you should know that an autistic child requires around 20 weekly hours of therapy a week. That was the latest study, 20 hours of therapy. But therapy can be cooking together, thinning together. It can be occupational therapy. It can be playing on a jungle gym as long as the time you play is interactional, is uh, purposeful, so you create tasks for your child, etc. All of these things are included in those 20 hours. It's not only speech therapy, occupational therapy, hydrotherapy, etc. But we do want to make sure that each child gets 20 hours a week of work, intangible work to help this child with their problems. So when a parent comes to me and says, oh, I've done stem cell therapy, there's no changes. I start asking. So I ask, how many hours did you spend with your child working? I ask, did you write down what you've done? Did you write down what this child was like before and what is he like now? Did you write down every week, every day? Or did you just write down a few words now before their meeting? Because the very first thing that happens when your child gets better is that you forget what he was like before. For example, if one of you can tell us what time did your child walk and on that day what happened? 
And I can promise you that none of you can. You remember roughly when it was, but you don't remember what happened that day. That means that during recovery or during rehabilitation, if we are not writing every single day what we've done with our child, we are not going to remember that the child got any better. Okay, so just before, sorry, questions. Um, you know what? If we can wait with questions for two more minutes, we're going to finish the lecture. We're going to let anybody who's not interested to continue to go, and then I'll answer questions. So, of course, as always, there are two ways to do things. The first way is to work on your own. Keep on doing the research on your own. Do the work on your own. Learn about rehabilitation on your own. And that's perfectly fine. There are lots of people who do it very well. Second option is to come and work with us. After many, many years of doing this, we have issued a program that helps parents go through this process safely, organizedly, with the knowledge you need to continue on going. And today, just to kick you off with a good start, we are offering you a consultation visit with me. Yes, yes. During this consultation, we'll discuss your child, their medical needs, their medical file. What's our clinic for you? If you want a clinic different than what we work with, how to work with your clinic, what do you want to ask? We will review a clinic together if you have a clinic that you already think about. And of course, we're going to give you the list. We have a checklist on how to review a clinic and how to work with clinics. Um, et cetera, I just said that, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, all you have to do is to register through the link I'm sending you right now, okay, down below. And you can also invite, um, also receive this uh, meeting. Of course, you can continue on, no problem. Um, from this meeting on, some parents need more help after this meeting. We can discuss this on with that particular meeting. But usually, after we meet once, parents know already how to continue on their own. So I'm going to leave this here for a moment if anybody wants to copy anything from the slideshow. And then if you want to ask a question, please just ask it using your own voice. Don't write because there's already a bunch of questions and I will not be able to <laughs> go over them. So again, I'm going to stop the share. If you have any questions, you can ask. And then anybody who's already seen the slideshow can leave and I can go back to the ones who haven't seen the different treatment options. So questions for those who've been here the whole lecture. And then I'll go back to whoever has come back in the middle over the treatment programs. Any questions from those who've been here the whole time? Um, just a suggestion. Yeah. Actually, um, I have joined your WhatsApp group. Yes. But it seems that not all the communication will be in English. So I'm honestly, I don't understand sometimes what is going on. That's okay. Um, My husband, he, okay. If you, we have a few different groups. We have a Facebook group that's mainly in Hebrew, but you can hear it okay. correctly. And we have WhatsApp group in Hebrew and WhatsApp group in English. Oh, probably I'm I'm joining WhatsApp group in Hebrew, you know, nothing. So <laughs> right, to go look for the manager, look for my husband. His name is Hagai. And he will give you the right group. <laughs> okay, what should I do to the to the to the current WhatsApp group? I have to find his name and then yes, just give him. Find his name. His name is Hagai Reiner. Okay. Okay. Can you please, can is, you if show, you don't mind, can you please put second, it in the chat box? So, uh, Hagai, are you on? Can you show yourself for a second so people can see you? Say hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm right here. This uh, time I'm then. sending a message in the WhatsApp groups, both English and Hebrew, so anybody can find me. After this lecture. Um, okay. And he will just take you to the right place. You can write in English in both groups. No problem. We'll <laughs> see what we can help you with, okay? Well, probably I will drop a message in the in the WhatsApp okay. group that I am in at the moment. and just make the request there. Hopefully you can see it. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Anybody else who wants to ask a question? And if not, I'm going to go back and explain what you have not seen. Uh, yes, I, 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 I put a question like a uh, resource. I think my, my son was experienced at resource at, at, at 18 months when he was a baby. 
Okay. Is that uh, like my uh, he will? Uh, it is. Is that dangerous? Is it anyway? Uh, it, it is like something excluding the candidates. Uh, yeah, the my kids are epileptic too, and they were treated in this protocol. We do see a lot of epileptic kids. This helps too. Mm -hmm. um, but you should be aware that we know because of the increased brain activity in the first uh, few hours after treatment, your child needs to be supervised by medical team because mm -hmm. there are very rarely children with epilepsy that can react in the first few mm -hmm. hours. It's very rare, but we have seen cases like that, unlike allergy, which I haven't, this one I have. Um, it's not dangerous, it's usually very light reaction, but it can happen. However, most epileptic children benefit from this treatment. Um, like my kids, my oldest haven't had a seizure in five years. My youngest hasn't had a seizure since October of 22 when he was treated. Um, so this is important. They're not taking medical, uh, any medicine for epilepsy now. So mm -hmm. I just want to go back because I know that some of you had missed some of the information. Uh, sorry, can, can I ask a question, please? I was trying to ask, but I was not uh, yeah. audible. Uh, in the case of bone marrow, what uh, precautions do you suggest? Because in India, we don't have uh, uh, the first two options are ruled out. Okay, bone marrow. I mean, India. No problem, bone marrow. You know what? I'm yeah. going to stay by the first two options, and then I'm going to go back to bone marrow just a couple of minutes, okay? But I promise, I promise I will explain all the precautions for bone marrow. Okay. Oh, so again, you. stem cells. We have five kinds, okay? For children, we use three kinds, and we are going to discuss them right now. First option, cord blood. Cord blood is what you see here on the screen is cord blood units. Okay, this is what it looks like. It was taken from a baby during birth. We collect it from the umbilical cord. To get cord blood, you need the same kind of blood type. Okay, that's the most important thing you have to remember. You have to check your child's blood type. They will check it also in the clinic. Okay. Cord blood has two very important side effects that you will see when your child gets cord blood. You will see them directly after the administration. They have no medical issues whatsoever, but you will see them. One is the scent. Your child is going to stink. This material will come out of his um, sweat, his mouth, and the urine. They will smell. Okay. If you if you didn't put yourself on silent, please do because then we we will hear everything that goes on in your background. The other is change of urine color. It will take a few times after the child has cord blood to get that back to normal. And these are perfectly fine. Three side effects of cord blood that are a problem. One is allergy. Oh God, okay. Whoever is making noise, here we go. Sorry, whoever, I just muted you because I can't talk when you talk with me. Okay, so three side effects of cord blood during the administration itself. One is allergic reaction, which is why before cord blood, you would give antihistamine. Very rare, I have not seen it in my life, but it's on paper possible. Two, fever. Up to 48 hours, you can have low-grade fever. Please give something for fever. Whatever you give at home is perfectly fine. And the last one is shivering. It's a result of fever. Perfectly fine once you give some Tylenol or some um, Akamal, whatever, it will disappear. That's cord blood. If you are planning to have a baby, please preserve your baby's cord blood. It's essential for treating children. Don't waste it. Because to get cord blood, somebody has to give birth to a baby. This is not something we can duplicate. Cord blood can also become bone marrow. It's important to know, but not exactly the reason why we are here. Okay. Second, second treatment, MSC. MSC, mesenchymal stromal cells, cells coming from fat. In this particular case, the fat that comes from the placenta and umbilical cord, also known as Wharton jelly. These cells are very ancient cells. So they come from the very 
first part of development of baby, what we call the morula. So this is the part where your embryo is not even implanted in your uterus yet. It has an outer cell, an outer shell and an inner shell. The inner shell becomes a baby. The outer shell becomes the placenta. The unique part of these kind of cells is that they do not, do not have HLA mechanism. So your body doesn't know to recognize them as something foreign. Unlike cord blood, that they can, and that's why we need to have matching. So in this kind of cell, we do not need a matching uh, protocol. We just give this kind of cell to every human who is in need from every healthy delivery. Again, this cell is being made in the lab. So what's the lab like is important. If the lab is very particular, or if the lab is very, very good, we know the cell is going to be very, very well preserved, very, very tested. It's important. And that's exactly what we talked about previously with the issue that we have about the labs in the States, for example. They are not supervised properly in most places, and that means that we are trusting them to work well, um, which was what we discussed previously. And the last one, as I promised you, bone marrow. Bone marrow is an okay procedure to do. We do bone marrow hundreds of thousands of times every day, every day. But bone marrow is an invasive procedure. What happens during bone marrow extraction is that we poke a few times the bone and we draw out the inside of the bone, also called bone marrow where our stem cells are being produced in our body. Every time we poke a bone, we risk infection. Yes, we take measurements and we do it under surgical conditions and we work really, really hard. It's not going to happen, but it is possible. And once you get an infection in your bone, it's very difficult to get rid of. So here are my lookouts. First of all, bone marrow extraction done in surgical environments sterile environment. We work very hard and we cover this child with antibiotics before and after extraction, or at least after. After this procedure, your child will be in some pain. That's normal if you poke somebody's bone. Please make sure every four to six hours to give this child something for the next few days. Okay, we do pain management with this baby, okay, or with this child. We don't do that to children under the age of one year old and under 12 kilo. It's very important to know. And afterwards, we have to understand this bone marrow goes through a procedure. It's being spun around in a centrifuge and part of it is being injected back to the child. Please ask in what method. Mostly it's being injected intratechally, so into the spine. When we inject something into the spine, we are poking the membranes of the spine. A side effect of that, whether you've taken an epidural for giving birth or any other procedure you do through the spine, can be CSF leakage. The fluid of the spine and the brain can leak out. It's very rare, but personally, I had the joy of experiencing it. What happens to a person that goes through CSF leakage is serious bad headaches you will see a person that cannot lift their heads up. That can happen anywhere between immediately after procedure or two to three days after. If your child complains about heavy, heavy headaches or nausea or not being able to pick up their head, please go back and do blood patch, which is where we take a little bit of the child's blood and stick it where we poke them. Yes, I know it doesn't sound well, which is why I don't like bone marrow. Uh, however, it's a fairly effective way to give self-donated stem cells, okay? Um, so again, I'm repeating myself. We look for what they do to prevent infection. We give medical attention to the child. We make sure they get pain relief three to uh, six times a day, depending on what your child and what's your pain relief method. We make sure this child is back to normal. So he can go back to playing, he can do whatever. We make sure that his head feels fine, 
if she's not vomiting or anything like that. And we look for signs of infection for the next week or so. Okay. So that was that. I'm going back to the question stage. This is the time. Open your microphones. Ask whatever you need. We are finished for the day. You're more than welcome to register yourselves for the meeting, for personal meeting to help you start the process with whatever clinic you like. Um, clinics that work directly with us and give discounts or any other benefits, you have to register through us. So Swiss Medica and CBC. They both provide some benefits to whoever registers through us. You cannot get them if you have gone there on your own. So if you want their service, please register with us first. Questions from anybody who wants to, this is your time now. Yes, uh, in case like I am planning for a pregnancy like IVF treatment, but uh, if, if, you, if, if, he, if my baby will be half sibling of my autistic kid, so it if can... they have the same blood type, it's possible to use. Okay. But with IVF, I used to be the cord blood bank manager here in Israel. And this is really important. When you do IVF, there is a very small, very, very small chance of neurological issues. Please don't use this baby's cord blood until your baby is a year and a half old, where we can first see the signs of development issues. Okay. okay. That's yeah, really I, important. Okay, but if 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 I want to uh, store this core blood or the placenta, do you do you know any institution in Europe that can help? Yes, with that? you can use you can use CBC. CBC. Contact CBC. Email, contact, uh, contact us. Okay, contact my guy, my husband. CBC mm -hmm. has a private sector where you can store blood in their facility. Uh -huh. Blood, like you mean the, the yes. core blood? Core blood, yes. They have yeah, were, they have a private facility where you can store your blood there. For and also the placenta. I think they do. Yes. But uh, how how do they do that in in, in Europe? You you came because to Europe. CBC CBC has multiple locations. It's a very big company, and they have okay. multiple locations in multiple countries. Okay, and you can definitely ask them. Where are you from in Europe? Sweden. From Sweden, I think if you contact your healthcare provider, okay, and you ask them, because in Sweden, the health system is a little different, and you ask them for information, they will know how to give it to you. Your gynecologist or whoever follows up on you, ask them, they will know to give you this information. <clears throat> okay, uh, they, uh, here, they, the hospital here in, um, in Sweden, like the public healthcare, they don't they don't have resources to uh, no to you, the midwife collects it the midwife will collect it to a kit you will purchase ahead of time so when you come to the hospital you bring a kit with you i used to have plenty of them in my house i don't work for for blood company right now i left in may <laughs> to do what i do now full time um but i used to have plenty of kits in my house because i would teach nurses how to collect them you have a special kit. It comes usually in a bag or a carton board, and it's sterile. And you take it, you give it to your midwife, and she collects it during childbirth. Collect like a, they freeze it? No, she will draw the blood out, and you will call your provider, the person you oh. bought the kit from, and they will come and collect it from you. Oh. And they have to collect it within 48 hours. Okay, that was it's okay. the whole big thing. How about you schedule a meeting with me, and I will help you, okay? Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, anyone else? This is your time. Yes, I get a question. They say mesenchymal cells, they are too huge when they are administered through the IV. They yeah. are too huge to go through the to through the to go to the brain okay, and all really that. That's a good question. One of my favorites. Okay. So remember I show you this vial. Okay, and I said inside there are exosomes. Exosomes are particles of the inside of the stem cell basically the active part, okay? And these are teeny tiny and they can penetrate even the brain blood barrier, okay? But what people don't know about stem cells is that they mainly affect our immune system and our immune system is not in our brain, <laughs> okay? The biggest effect it does is on our immune system which affects our brain and that's the main way stem cells work. So they don't actually have to go through your blood brain barrier, but the exosomes can. And what happens for stem cells, all stem cells, 
no matter what the origin is, the first station is in our lungs. And many people don't know that our immune system also matures partly in our lungs, okay, which is why we are very serious about lung infection. If you ever had a child which had a lung infection or very bad lungs, doctors are always very, very worried about their immune system. That is part of it because our immune system matures in our lungs. The stem cells will arrive to your lungs and about 40% of them will set there. Okay, so this is where they will end their station. This is their last stop. Inside, they will blow up and send their exosomes out. These exosomes will fly through your um, bloodstream and will eventually get to your brain through diffusion. So they will diffuse its way through the blood-brain barrier. So this is an excellent question, um, but this is how they get to your brain. So the way you give stem cells of any kind doesn't matter. What matters is this process, and it will happen with any kind of stem cells you will give your child. Here you go. Biology for a whole semester in, in two minutes. <laughs> My other question is that the exosomes I heard, they are like an army without commander. If you, if you get, for example, if I get only exosomes to my autistic son, um, what do you think? Is that, you know, how okay. it will work? So it's all about um, quality and quantity, okay? So when I get the full stem cell, then I get the maximum quality and also the maximum quantity. But again, they will go over my entire bloodstream, so everywhere in my body. It's a big mistake to think that autism is just in our brain. It's not just in our brain. This is something to do with our immune system. So it's in our stomach, it's in our skin, it's in our wrist, it's in our joints, it's in our eyes. It's it, Sometimes you see children who has um, uh, perioral sores. This is also part of the same manifestation of the same problem, the immune system problem. And I don't like to treat autistic children just with inhaled exosomes. For me, it's saying, okay, autism is just in the brain. However, I think that these are completing methods. So it's not just the one thing, but you should do the whole package to get maximum results. However, I have a lot of patients that can't travel and cannot get any other kind of stem cell. And then I say, okay, this is better than nothing. It definitely has an effect. Maybe not the best effect, but it has an effect. So let's start there, see where we go from there. So here's my answer. I hope it helps. <laughs> Anything else you want to ask? This is the time. Yeah. Uh, one question. You say that, that the stem cells uh, we, we they can we can also uh, like uh, inhale some uh, yes. exosomes. Or I don't remember. So the... there is good labs. Okay, very good labs. They know how to extract exosomes, so the inside of the stem cells, and put it in a vial. Okay, it looks something like this, and you spray it twice a day in your child's nostrils, one per inside. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this is something that not all labs know how to do. Today, we know that plenty of labs want to make this product. Now, this product, this is not a regular medicine. It doesn't sit on a shelf. It has to come frozen. So for example, I get mine from um, Swiss Medica. When I go to Swiss Medica, part of their protocol is to provide you with exosomes, exosomes in health at home. I come, I come with freezing units, so these in Israel, they're blue. <laughs> the ones you put in your uh, cooler when you go for a trip, I take a few of those, and they also provide me a special freezing bag, and I put them in a cooler, and I bring them home. And then I will put them in my freezer on the deepest freezing uh, setting. Here in Israel, it's 20, minus 24 degrees Celsius. And I will take one every 10 days, defrost it for 12 hours in my fridge, and leave it in my fridge and use it twice a day. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, how, we can, I know. <laughs> how we can get this in, in Sweden? Because we have a legislation. You buy, it, you buy it from a company like Swiss Medica in Belgrade, and you go and you take it from them. 
to take a plane, you buy it there, and you go back home with it. Ah, okay. With, with your, uh, like, freezer, like a portable freezer. Yes. With a oh, portable okay. freezer, I have, in Europe, I have patients who travel by car, I have patients who, who uh, take a plane, whatever. Uh, oh. But you do need to keep it in a freezing unit or in a in a cooler of some sort with cooling racks, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, sorry, so Swiss Medica is in Serbia? Like Swiss you Medica are... is in Serbia. Please oh. register for my consultation, okay? Is... I have a link here in the chat, and I will sit over all of this information. This is technical information. I will sit with you and explain to you what companies there are, how you get it, etc. okay? Because it's, it's a long explanation. And just one, one uh, last. It, it is the same effect. Almost, it's almost the same effect. Like uh, no, the... it's a different effect, and it varies from one child to another. Some oh. children will have very good effect. For example, um, when we went to Swiss Medica a month ago, we were there with our youngest. Um, somebody from Israel asked for one vial, just one. They usually give five. Okay, just the one she asked. Um, and she said that after two days, she saw an effect. Other people used for a month, didn't see anything. There is a difference between the children. So I cannot tell you in advance if your child will react to it on a singular treatment. So this will be the only way of giving or not. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that's worth trying if you cannot fly with your child. However, it does cost money. It's not a cheap drug. Okay. okay? Yeah, can, can we know the price or it is something you that we... need to ask the company they are at liberty to change their prices so i don't get involved they every time you ask a request they will get you a consultation and also a price for whatever they will consult you okay, okay. So they will give you the prices okay thank you any other questions this is your time now Yes, I have a question. Go for it. Uh, how many treatment is needed for the, the bone marrow? Like, is it on one bone time? Some... Yeah. Is there a particular reason you choose bone marrow? Yeah, because we, we don't, uh, I'm, with, I'm one of Jehovah's Witness, so we don't take a, a uh, people's uh, blood. Okay. Where are you from, Afia? From Denmark. From Denmark. So why would you go for bone marrow? Why not go for stem cells from umbilical cord or from um from MSC? Why? Yeah, because because it's not our own; it's other persons. Okay, so uh, this is this is a personal reason. This is not a medical reason. That's why. Right. No. How many procedures? So we start with when, and this is always true. We only start with when, and we follow up on this child for six months. Okay. For example, for you, I would recommend going to Dr. Kubinia. He's in Austria. He's very good. I work okay. with him. He's very good. Okay. Um, and he follows up on the children for six months. After six months, if he feels that the results are good enough, then he will ask you to come for a second treatment. Okay. Okay. But we always, for any treatment, it doesn't matter which one, we always follow up at least six months. After six months, if we worked well and we did post-treatment properly and we gave the child lots of therapy hours and we see the child has progressed more than you would have in the past, then it's okay to come back for a second treatment. There are clinics that does this treatment every month, but I don't recommend doing it less than three to four months difference. That's my minimum. Usually, maximum effect we can estimate after six months. Okay, but the uh you have to understand when we draw bone marrow, it takes the time for the bone marrow to be rebuilt itself. So we at least at least thirty days, at least the minimum. We don't do any more aspirations. Okay, there are companies that tells you every two weeks. No not over two weeks, at least 30 days. That's the minimum. And I don't think there's a point to do it more than at least four to six months apart because I will not be able to see the changes, okay? Even if this child is a very fast responder, 
it's very difficult to say right away if there is a significant amount of change. And each time I, I do this procedure, I'm risking infection. So yes, the risk is not terribly big, but it's there. And when your child gets it, you are the 100%. Okay, it doesn't matter that it's only 2% chance. If this is your child, this is the 100%. So please wait at least four to six months between treatments. So you can see that there is something there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, I recommend Dr. Kubinya. You can say my name that I have sended you. Sometimes he gives benefits to, you no know, financial benefits to whoever. It's his business, but I definitely recommend him. He's in Austria. You can find his lecture on our website and on our Facebook group. He came and gave a good lecture. I think he's a very good doctor. Lots of experience. More okay. questions before we say goodbye? Yes, yes. sorry. Um, yes. For example, I live in the United States and Austria is too far for me. Uh, for what bone clinic? Marrow. Not bone marrow, even what anything. I don't want to do. I did bone marrow prior, but some the regular stem cell. Just try different things. So what you have you... Dr. Travis in Arizona. You have quite a few. We have a list on our Facebook. Okay. You can go in and, and look, or you can write to my husband. He will send you the links to the different clinics. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank Great. you so much for your help. We appreciate your knowledge. You're very welcome. We'll see you soon. Any more questions before we say goodbye? Um, we were yes. asked about a lab. Hang on before I forget. Uh, any lab link for CBC? They we have two or three lectures for them in um in uh, our Facebook group. But please register through my husband, through Haggai, write to him. He will write you, he will register you. So they will come and talk to you. He can do the registration for you to ask for consultation and they will contact you within a few days. How, how can we register that? What's, where's the link on so your Facebook? Write to my husband, okay? Write in the group. I'm asking for registration to whatever company you want and he will send it to you. Okay, right in the group. I'm asking for registration to what clinic he will send it for you. Okay. Great. Any more questions before we say goodbye? Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can ask this. Uh, because you say uh, bone marrow is, you didn't like that procedure, but it seems like more. Um, safe for me since it is autologous like from the person no I rejection no difference. i a lot of people feel like uh, bone marrow is safer um using stem cells but all research had shown between the three methods there's no difference usually bone marrow is a personal choice so it can be because of religion uh oh. for example um some jewish people they believe that uh, you should only get material from another Jewish person. Not me personally, I find it racist and I don't mind, uh, but some Jewish people feel that way. Or for example, Amish community, they will not receive bone marrow or blood not from self-donated. So they mm -hmm. can receive blood, but only if you donate it to yourself. Okay. Um, they That's do awesome. not do that. They do not receive blood per blood or any but the organs from another person, for example. So this is the religious purpose. Okay. Yeah. Oh, but for me, it sounds like more safe if it is your own cells and not the. Uh, Sorry, no difference. No, no difference. difference because no. there is like a match procedure uh, to prepare this. So I I guess. No, be... even even in bone marrow, you do not take the bone marrow and immediately put it back. No, it has to go through a laboratory process. Oh. It's a very long one, about half an hour long, but still human hands touch it, same problem. Oh. And also you go through the same medical test, by the way. Same. Uh, infectious diseases, um, uh, hepatitis, all these things. Okay. okay. All links you can ask in the group, in the WhatsApp group, and you will get them. Okay, You will get registration for these clinics. Okay. Any questions for now? Because we are at the end of our time and we are about to say goodbye. 
Thank you very much for your time. You're very Thanks. welcome. Bye -bye. You're more than welcome to join and get a personal um meeting. The link is in the chat. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You're bye -bye. very welcome. Goodbye. Very good luck to everybody. Very, very welcome. Goodbye. Have a good day. Bye. Isabel, Emilio, do you want to ask anything? If not, it's time to say goodbye.